All right, I'm Andrew McConville, and this project is open source food, designing an augmented reality user experience to visualize the origins and logistics of food. And so the problem that this work hopes to address is how might we enable people to trace the origins of their food? So when you're eating a meal and you're wondering where each of those ingredients in your meal comes from, this project hopefully will allow you to figure that information out. And so to start the project off, I, I use design thinking, which is a problem solving framework. And so I'll go through a couple slides here to talk about my ideation process. And so I knew this was going to be an AR project, but I didn't really have a domain to apply it to. And so using a PES analysis, SWOT analysis and value canvas, I knew I kind of wanted to came up with the idea of addressing something in the sustainability realm, also something with human human rights and labor rights. And food had a pretty big overlap in that area. I also wanted to do something that was visual and interactive, being that I'm a designer. And so once I knew what the project was going to be about, I needed to figure out who it was going to be for. And so here are three different personas that I came up with. The first is your typical restaurant goer. The second is maybe educators or maybe parents or maybe even kids themselves somebody who is looking to learn where food comes from and <clears throat> be taught about the process and logistics and, and how their hamburger is made. The third is restaurant owners. And while, you know, maybe McDonald's or Burger King might not necessarily want to give full transparency into how they source their ingredients, there's probably you know, local restaurants or organic restaurants that while they are making a bunch of claims, they might also use this app to kind of validate those claims or back up those claims and, you know, say, we're saying all of our, our, our tomatoes are vine ripened. Well, here, look at this app and you can, you can validate that what we're saying is actually true. I then moved on to creating a journey map. And so this is me taking that persona, the restaurant goer persona and putting them in a context where they're actually going to use this application. So what are the things that they're gonna do? What are they gonna be experiencing in the real world? What is happening around them that they will be able to then make use of this application? So in my case, they're at a restaurant, they are seeing a bunch of perhaps marketing claims, or they're sitting down with friends and people are talking about, oh, wait, I wonder where this ingredient came from, or you know, this restaurant is claiming everything here is, is vine ripened. Well, how do we go about figuring that out? And so the user in this case, hopefully is able to pull out their smartphone and scan their meal and start going down that, that journey of where their food came from. And so jumping off that journey map, the solution that this, this work is trying to solve is you're at a restaurant. And so this is happening at time of consumption. So you're at a restaurant, which means we have your location. If the mobile device knows where you are, we know the restaurant that you're at. It also, your mobile device has a camera. And so we can use that to detect what the ingredients are. And so with the restaurant and the ingredients, and then second here, transparency, if we have access to the food data, we should be able to tell where the entire meal came from. And hopefully a user <clears throat> that has access to that information will be able to assess, you know, does this restaurant align with my animal rights ethics or labor ethics, or is it, does it align with what I'm trying to do as far as diet goes, as far as health goes, or maybe even allergies or something else. There's lots of different possibilities there to invoke behavior change. And so this is an AR application, which is a little bit different than VR and has some special considerations. Whereas when you're in VR, you're in a fully generated environment. So the environment is created by somebody. All the objects within that environment are created by someone. Their positions are known because a person put them there and their properties are known because the person created them. Whereas AR, on the other hand, has to look around. The camera has to be pointed at something and the device has to be able to assess and interpret what it's looking at, in this case, food, before we can then go and get data on that piece of food. Food data, in this case, is, is kind of a tricky one. Um, there's tons of nutritional apps and nutritional APIs out there that will give you essentially that, that black and white nutritional panel off of a, you know, a box of cereal or something like that. 
And that's not exactly what this app is looking for. This app is looking for the logistics of all of those pieces of food, all those ingredients. And so here, <clears throat> there's several companies out there that are, you know, proprietary closed systems that deal with food logistics. Getting that data is not really possible. However, the, the FDA in this case, in, in 2026, they have hopefully a kind of standardized data data model that's coming out that could be used for this application in kind of determining how all the events, they call them key data events, that a piece of food kind of collects as it moves through the system. So when it's harvested and when it's shipped and when it's cooled and when it's packaged and when it's repackaged. And so for this, the, uh, the project goes off of this FDA proposed data model. And so jumping back to AR, the question that this work is really looking into is how much AR is enough AR? And so what that means is you can see in the, in the screenshot here, the user is going to be pointing their, their camera, their device at a meal, at some ingredients, and they're going to be getting a lot of information back. And so where does that information go? Where should that information be? If you're going to get a timeline of where, say, a tomato came from, where was the tomato grown and harvested and cooled and grated and packaged? If you're going to see all those events, where should they be? Should they be inside the AR experience? And I kind of did not think so. Presenting a ton of data, of text data that has to be read uh, inside a rather small AR experience, perhaps an AR experience, if it really models the geometry of the 3D world, if, if you have text receding back into space, that text is going to be very small. It's going to be very hard to read. And if you have buttons and clickable links that also re recede into the three-dimensional space, the, the further away they are, they're also going to be very hard to click and very hard to interact with. And so I went with a mixed mode where AR, in this case, enables a user to select the ingredient so it identifies what the user has it lets the user select the ingredient and then we move on to a more traditional um, application where text is presented within a browser and so i was kind of interested though how would to what extent would users want to interact with this would they be clicking and and tapping on the the food object itself or if as we can see in the in the screenshot of the phone under that AR experience, under that video feed, there's also a list of buttons of every ingredient. And so I was interested in what are users going to interact with, the AR feed or the traditional list below the AR feed. Oh, this application is also responsive. Um, for usability testing, everything was done on a, on a phone. All 28 participants had phones. But if you were on a tablet or maybe even like a really wide or really large phone, instead of the one column layout, you could get two columns. And if for some odd reason you were trying to point your laptop at your meal, you could interact with this web application with three columns, which is what it has in total. There's the camera view. And then once you select an ingredient, there's the ingredients timeline view. And then when you want to really drill into all those events that took place, there's the event details view. So there's three panels on desktop. You see them all and on mobile, they are a stacked experience. All right. And so let's get into some of the results. So there were 28 participants, um, only two Android users. That was kind of a bummer. I was interested to see what would happen there, but more interesting is that the results are kind of 50-50. 16 users use the AR buttons, whereas 12 use the HTML buttons. And so it's kind of close. It, it wasn't really unanimous one way or the other. However, there are some user segments which did prefer AR a lot more than the HTML buttons. And I'll get to the user segments in a, in a second. But I had two tasks for my participants to complete. And so here, task one, the participant, all they had to do was figure out how long ago a tomato was harvested. And this was to get them to point their device at the tomato, at the hamburger, and for me to see what do they click on. Do they click on the AR video or do they click on the HTML buttons? Task two was to see how users reacted to jargon. And so this had them figure out how the tomato was ripened 
And in this case, there's a lot of jargon and technical terminology around the ripening process. And so I was curious to see um, if they'd be able to figure this information out when it's all shrouded in jargon. However, there was a rather big surprise here that somewhat derailed my experiment. And so here are the 10 usability heuristics. Specifically, I was interested in number two for this test. Does the, does the system match the real world? So the system here has a ton of jargon in it. People in the real world don't really talk like that. So ideally, however people talk in the real world, the app should reflect that. However, I inadvertently ran into number four here, consistency and standards. And so if we look at the homepage, my buttons for ingredients, the hamburger, lettuce, bread, and tomato, are like teal buttons. When we move over to the timeline view in the middle, the second view, the buttons still exist. However, the buttons are kind of confused with headings. They kind of, they're kind of doing double duty. And that definitely showed in testing because about half of my users did not know they could click those timeline events to then get more information. And so we'll take a look at those results in a second. Overall, went pretty good. There was a sus score. I had a I had a, a survey at the end that collected a reaction card test and a sus survey, and also I got uh, demographics on a lot of my users. So we'll be able to look at segments here. Positive results are pretty good. So I split my reaction cards into two columns: positive and negative. Um, I did that because typically what happens is most users won't really give negative feedback. So forcing them to pick words from a negative column forced them to give negative feedback, although I did have one user who refused to do that. Here we could see most users refer to the app as informative, impressive, responsive, understandable. That's good. That's kind of what I wanted. Negative responses were intimidating, confusing, and overwhelming, which I think kind of made sense because the AR feed is very busy and it's there's a lot happening there, especially if you're wiggling your phone and you're moving around a lot. Some of the other words were trivial and boring and ordinary, which not great words, but at the same time kind of made sense because here it's an information app. So you kind of don't want it to be too fancy or too entertaining. You want users to get in, find the information they need, and then get out. And so with the demographic data, I was able to slice this up into about five or six different user segments. And we can see here, the first one was the users that I had, 14 were from an intelligent user interface computer science course. And then I had another 14 participants in an interaction design course through Peck School of the Arts. And the students in the art class, 71% favored the AR buttons, whereas the comp sci students favored the HTML buttons. And I'm really not sure why that is, but that is a pretty large gap between the preferences of the user or the participant in this case. You'll also see that in that same column, in that same segment, the art students were very critical of the app. The positive sus scores out of five never went past a four. But if we jump over to the female versus male segment, this one is pretty big as far as the difference goes. The users that required help. So male users, 86.7% of male users asked for help when navigating the application, whereas only 23.1% of female users needed help. Also, when it came to identifying the link, 76.9% of female users found it without any problem, whereas only 46.7% of male users could find the link. So there's definitely more research to be done there. These are, you know, quantitative metrics, which is, you know, telling me what's happening, how people are behaving, how the participants are behaving, but I don't really know why. And so maybe some user interviews would work here or really just kind of drilling down and watching what is happening when either a female participant or male participant are interacting with the application. Also interesting, people who wear glasses versus people who don't wear glasses. Glasses wearers preferred the AR buttons. Three quarters of glasses wearers chose them, chose an AR button versus only a quarter choosing the HTML buttons. Also kind of weird. Don't really know why that one is. 
Um, the people who use the AR labels or buttons versus the HTML lists, columns J and K, if you use the AR experience, you gave the application the highest sus score of an 81. Whereas if you use the HTML list, you gave it the lowest. I have no idea why that is, but that is a very big discrepancy. So still more work to be done here for sure. And so next steps, um, a ton of quantitative data and a bunch of surprising results there. And so um, definitely something qualitative to figure out why. I'm thinking user interviews might be nice. Um, maybe not with another 28 participants. I could probably figure it out with, with only like four to six and and just kind of slow it down and ask them, you know, why they're choosing what they're choosing, what they're thinking. I did have them do a think aloud while they were doing each task, but um, they were pretty quiet. I didn't really, from all 28 participants, I didn't really get too much, too much talking. So I didn't really get too much insight into what they were thinking, but something to be done there. It would also be nice to figure out and attach some behavior change metrics to this process um, or to this project. You know, maybe how are people eating now? And if they were to use this app, how might they be eating after? Some more features that could go into it. It does not allow access to uh, the, the participant to change their, their geolocation. And so right now it only works at the restaurant but it might be a lot more useful to use the app before you're at the restaurant. So manually selecting the restaurant you want to go to and then looking through um, the logistics of, of all their, their ingredients and figuring out where they came from, um, you know, before you go. So then you can decide if you want to go or not. Also, it wouldn't work for grocery store items either. However, grocery store items would be a little bit easier to use in this system because they already have a batch code. They already have the data printed on them. And so it might be nice to be able to use the AR experience to scan a batch code and then give somebody the logistical history of that, of that um, food item. Also, this was not connected to an um, API for detecting food in this, in this testing. The only thing that could be detected was a piece of lettuce, a tomato, piece of bread or a piece of meat. And so for usability testing, that was perfect. That's all we really needed. But for this to go live, it would need to be able to detect any kind of food and any kind of ingredient. And then also food data, finding a, a source, somebody to partner with that would want to expose all their food data, that would be critical in making this even more real and usable by anybody. And last but not least here, there is a QR code. This project is live on GitHub pages. And so anybody is free to experiment with it and mess around with it. Again, it only detects a handful of things, mostly by color. And with that sentiment over here on the left, you can see that while I was building the app and debugging it on my computer, on my desktop computer, it was mostly pointed at my face and not a piece of food. And so I spent most of the time with a hamburger label attached to my face.